everyone. Good afternoon. The Fowler Museum at UCLA acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tulangar, uh, also known as the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the indigenous peoples in this place. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, the elders, and our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. Thank you, Matthew. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Fowler Museum's doors reopen to the public on July 1, and we are thrilled to be welcoming visitors back to our galleries. But for now, we are continuing to offer our programs digitally. So thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to be presenting today's program in partnership with the UCLA American Indian Studies Center. The map in the territory includes two site-specific installations by Tongva artists Mercedes Doremi and River Garza, featuring objects excavated in Southern California along with archival materials from the Fowler's archaeological collection. The installations prompt viewers to examine the processes by which institutions like the Fowler acquire, catalog, store, and study objects from indigenous communities. The installations give new meaning to these objects, creating new spaces of intersection and understanding. Today, we are joined by the artists, the Fowler's chief curator, Matthew H. Robb, and senior curator of archeology, span Wendy Teeter, for a conversation about these installations, the artists' ongoing projects, the systems that have brought such objects to the Fowler, and the dialogues between tribal communities and museums. Mercedes Dormi is a visual artist who calls on her Tongva ancestry to engage the problematics of visibility and ideas of cultural construction as an outcome of the need to tie one's existence to the land. Dormi was recently honored by UCLA as an outstanding alumna of the past 100 years and was part of the Hammer Museum's 2018 Made in LA Biennial. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Hammer Museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum at UC Berkeley, among other institutions. Dormy was born in Los Angeles, received her under undergraduate degree from UCLA, and her MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. River T. Garza is an LA-based artist of indigenous and Mexican descent, a paddler, and a member of the Tiat Society. Garza's work draws on Tongva and Mexican cultures, traditional indigenous aesthetics and graffiti, as well as Southern California indigenous maritime culture. He uses his work to critique settler capitalism while exploring how the literal and metaphoric layers of colonialism add weight to contemporary indigenous identity, which is a source of both pain and creativity. Before we get going, I have two quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and select side by side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during the program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at, the, found at the bottom of your Zoom screen to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's enough for me. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Bianca, and thanks uh, everyone for coming and um, joining this virtual conversation today. Uh, thanks as well, as, as Bianca mentioned, to UCLA's American Indian Study Center for their support of this program. Um, it's always important, I think, to say that those land acknowledgments that we present at the beginning of our programs um, is the beginning of the conversation, uh, the beginning of the work that institutions and individuals need to do to acknowledge uh, their presence on indigenous lands. And for the Fowler, we're always looking uh, for ways to do that. Um, through artistic uh, endeavors like these, through scholarship and research on the collection, uh, and especially through engagement with indigenous communities and the, the culture bearers and the knowledge bearers in those communities. Um, and, and just even being able to work uh, with River and with Mercedes um, is the result of that engagement over a long period of time. 
Uh, I'm thinking especially of Cindy Elvitre, uh, who's worked very closely with the Fowler and with Wendy on a number of different projects and exhibitions. Um, I'm thinking as well of a program uh, that the Fowler did a couple of years ago, organized by Nancy uh, Nisla, that teaches, who teaches at UCLA, um, that also included Mercedes and Wendy. Um, and, and that uh, how I first came to know Mercedes work through her inclusion at the Hammer Biennial a couple of years ago that Bianca mentioned. Um, and one of the programs that the Hammer had was a, a conversation with her and Wendy um, and Angela Riley from uh, UCLA's law school. Um, and so a couple of years ago, when we began developing this exhibition focused on the history of collections at UCLA as part of the university's centennial celebrations, it seemed to me that we had a chance to explore uh, how archives and collections and museums on campus need to tell the story, not just of what they have, but also of where they are. And for the Fowler, that meant exploring how to include the archaeology collection, uh, which is Wendy will tell you is a vast resource of the history of this region. Uh, and so I also wanted to try um, and include objects um, about that theme uh, from our two main um, institutional collaborators, the Hammer and the, and the Library. Uh, Erica, uh, the next slide. And one more. There we go. Um, and so as we gathered all of these different um, uh, curators and archivists and um, collections managers to talk about what, they're, what they might contribute to this exhibition, um, when the Hammer came over, uh, Ann Elgood, uh, who's then at the Hammer and is now at the Institute of Contemporary Art here in LA, uh, included Mercedes's work, the photographs, <clears throat> uh, one of which you see on the screen here, as a potential inclusion from the Hammer's collection. And that's when the penny began to really drop for me. Um, uh, the other thing that I was focused on with respect to the library, um, next slide, Erica. So I was also interested in finding the oldest image of campus that was on campus. Um, and that meant going back to these uh, diseños, the, the book that you see here, there are sketch maps and ranches um, uh, of the ranches in California that the Spanish colonial government had, had granted uh, to individuals and institutions. Um, many of these land grants persisted through Mexican independence from Spain and then after the Mexican-American War uh, when they were transferred to the United States government. Um, and these drawings um, uh, record the boundaries um, of these land grants and, ran and ranches. And of course, all of them uh, are some of the, the earliest representations of ancestral indigenous lands that the Spanish had taken um, when establishing the mission system and uh, divvying up the land for economic exploitation and commercial development. And that is the history of the land uh, that, that UCLA occupies in a, in a brief nutshell. Um, what you're seeing here uh, is the book of the diseños that UCLA has, um, as well as the map on the right hand page. You're, you're sort of looking at it from the side. Um, this is the area uh, known as the Rancho de San Jose de Buenos Aires, uh, later Bel Air, uh, and what we now call Westwood and eventually the UCLA campus. So we had two of those ingredients. And as I recall, that was about when Wendy said, why don't we bring in Mercedes and River uh, to see how they might explore the archaeology collection. And so uh, next slide, Erica. Shout out um, to our colleagues at the library, especially Heather Brisson from Special Collections, who helped facilitate um, a visit of the, the four of us um, to see the diseños and really flip through those books um, and spend a little time thinking about the, 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 the areas of the, of the region that they represented, um, as well as a lot of really intense work with uh, Fowler staff. Um, Sebastian Clough, our exhibition designer, worked very closely with both Mercedes and River on how to present the objects that they'd selected. Um, as well as to sort of uh, figure out ways to frame the ideas they wanted to present. Um, and there's always a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into this. Um, the members of the collection staff and the archeology span collection, keeping track of everything, caring for everything. Um, so Sedena Shulsky Gaiman and Mitzla Aguilera, uh, Jeanette Faust and Christian Jabrer uh, from the Fowler, all of them made sure that uh, we could do this, that we could work with River and Mercedes to, to present these collections um, uh, in an appropriate fashion. And through all of these conversations, River and Mercedes works really came to inform the, the logic and the narrative of the exhibition in a profound way. Uh, Mercedes work, um, when you come to see the exhibition at the Fowler, and I hope you do, um, is at the beginning of the uh, uh, exhibition with her photographs from the Hammer, uh, and nearby is that uh, diseño from uh, the, the diseño volume from the library, uh, giving us a real sense of that history uh, of, the, of here, uh, and how complex and personal that history can be. Uh, and River's installation closes the ex exhibition as a way of reminding visitors of just 
just how much uh, and what museums like the Fowler are responsible for, as well as uh, suggesting new ways that uh, institutions like the Fowler can engage with artists and members of tribal communities to ensure that they have access to these collections and that they are the ones who are shaping the stories about these collections. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Wendy to tell us more about the archaeology collection. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And um, I really appreciate uh, everyone who's taken the time out of their day to, to hear some of the conversations that we're going to have. As the senior curator of archaeology, my role and responsibility were for the collections that are within the Fowler Museum, but are derived from archaeological research and cultural resource management. Um, the next slide, Erica. Um, this just gives you a little bit of a snapshot. It, it is uh, over um, 6,000 boxes of cultural heritage that, that span um, the majority of, of Los Angeles County and then extends on into Ventura and the uh, Santa Barbara and the um, and adjoining areas. So what we end up with is when you, um, just to contextualize it, is when you have development going on, say the creation of the 101, it was UCLA graduate students and researcher, archaeology researchers, who actually went in and scoped the area with um, generally without native counterparts at that time in the 1950s and 1960s. But it, the um, families were still around and the native families were seeing what was going on. Those creation of those highway systems within California led to a mass amount of cultural heritage of the people who existed in California before it was created and they are now cared for in this space. So in, in sort of having these conversations over the last two decades as also UCLA's NACPRA coordinator, we really have spent a lot of time sort of talking about what that means in uh, this sort of daily course of doing work, making sure that there's access both to cultural resource management and staff people and researchers, but also to the native communities to re-engage with all of these um, ancestral belongings that had been removed for the creation of modern society. So we wanted to see if there was a way to sort of open that dialogue up and kind of share some of the conversations that we've been having in private and in the course of doing our professional work. Um, and uh, so that I'll, I'll, I'm gonna stop there because I want us to have more time to do this engagement with the um, with both River and Mercedes. Oh, and, and here's a picture of River actually going through some of the collections and, and doing that, that uh, physical manifestation of, of opening up the boxes and actually re-engaging. Thank you. Miha, it's so nice to be here. Thank you all for joining on a Saturday. Um, you can put up the first slide and I'll talk from there. So um, I came into this conversation around the uh, concept of curating from the collection and what does that mean? And, um, you know, I, I thought it was kind of beautiful to have the sketch involved because I really didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, but if you've seen it or when you see the next slide, it was kind of impressive to me that this kind of concept really came to fruition, even though this was made a year and a half ago, pre-COVID. I think I was in the archaeology collection in February of 2020, and it felt like so much time had passed and um, so much had shifted. But in a certain sense, there was, there was something about um, this project that was exciting to me because it was about giving life, giving air, giving breath to some of these objects that are um, incredibly important for me as a Tonga person, to the community, they're beautifully made, they're intricate, um, and, and what does it mean to kind of give them light and life and breath? And the funny thing was, is Matthew and I were signing some paperwork after I finished the installation, and I hadn't actually seen this sketch until, you know, it'd been a year and a half, and, and we both chuckled because somehow it, it really actually has the same um, feeling. Um, we can go to the next slide as the piece. Um, and so, uh, you know, thank you all to the team. At, you know, everybody has been so amazing to work with. It was such a fun experience. Um, but I had this idea of creating a spiral plinth. And Sebastian was like, yeah, we can do it. And I was like, wow, that's super exciting. So it actually exists in this spiral because I wanted to take it away from it looking like 
um, you know, so often when I, I see Tongva cultural belongings in uh, institutional spaces, it's very sterile. It's, it's kind of this very, um, you know, common treatment that exists in the fine art world as well of like, you know, the white platform and kind of that protection in front of it. And so I was really interested in creating a dynamic space to hold these objects. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and so I came in um, first to the, the archaeology collection, which was overwhelming in a certain sense, you know, I, I, those images that were shown earlier, you know, kind of the rows of boxes, it's, you know, you, there's just kind of rows and rows and, and it was a bit of an intuitive process because, you know, you'd open a box and you wouldn't quite know, it could be this, you know, gorgeous, um, arranged, you know, bag of beads, or it could be broken lithics, you know, there's, it was, it was kind of um, a surprise. And I think, you know, I'm so grateful. I don't think this project could have happened without the kind of trust relationship that is built over the years between um, Wendy and Matthew and myself and the Tonga community, because, um, you know, I didn't quite know how these objects would come to life. I, I kind of went through and I intuitively collected them. You can go to the next slide and the next one, other way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was really interested in um, looking at objects that were very intentionally made, you know, and, and beautiful, actually. You know, there's this bowl, you can see it in the, the image on the left, and it's enormous. We could barely lift it with the two of us, and it's beautiful. and. Um, I really highly suggest you go see it in person, you know, so for these larger, really amazingly crafted objects to these, you know, these tiny beads that are also intricately made um, and kind of playing a bit with what exists in a collection, the objects that are kind of held. Some are very clear about, you know, why they exist. Some are for me, very ambiguous, but also as a community member, you know, uh, you can actually advance one more. As a community member, even the pieces of abalone, which I used a lot of in this, and those, you know, they're very fragile. They kind of exist, you know, been handled and bagged and boxed, and you know, they're, they're, there's almost this dust, this this beautiful glitter dust that came out of those bags, and even those tiny bits, for me, are important. Um, it might not be something, uh, you know, as, as um, you know, hand shaped or something as a bead, but I really wanted to create this, this tension between um, the, the, the intentionality of the objects, the kind of existence, the, the creation by nature of some of the objects, and then how those two things interplay. And um, for me, it became islands and waterways and stars and the cosmos, um, you go one more slide. And this kind of, you know, overall um, world, you know, I, I've been kind of thinking somebody I was talking to recently said that some of the work I did was a, like a micro constellation. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, but, you know, it, it, it kind of creates this um, world for me. And, and it was also very important and kind of another full circle in that, you know, these images that are behind, which are part of the Hammer collection, you know, there's the suggestion of maybe including those as well. And I kind of think it's this beautiful, beautiful echoing because the picture of my father and Charlie, who's on the far left side, you know, that was actually taken at the site where these objects came from during the reburial process. And it's one of these like um, very important images for me. And um, my father has influenced and taught me so much in this process of cultural um, heritage and what that means to care for those things and work in that um, realm. And so there's this kind of beautiful feeling where I, I like to think that he's kind of like looking down or kind of this relationship exists between the actual community members to see these objects kind of have a new story to not maybe um, to create a new narrative around um, the potential for the life existing to kind of into the contemporary moment, not that it's an object that has no relevance or has only relevance in the past tense. Um, 
So I don't know if that, that was my eight minutes because I kind of did a different thing on the slide advance, but I think um, we can move on to river if that's okay. <clears throat> All right, Miha, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here on Saturday. Um, very grateful for this opportunity to talk about this work. Um, yeah, can we start with the first slide, please? All right, so um, <clears throat> my, my installation really came to be through, um, through interacting with the archeological collection. It was like my, it was my first time um, being able to see, uh, yeah, the, the collection of the Fowler and really interacting with a lot of these objects. Like I really had no like understanding of <laughs> what it takes to, that goes into preserving these items, how many objects were, were in, are in the collection. Like uh, as Wendy had mentioned previously, there's like 6,000 boxes that relate to, you know, Southern California, different sites. So it was, um, Overwhelming. I think Mercedes mentioned that as well. Um, just to kind, of, just really grasping with the scale of these things and how much information and how many items were were there. So, um, the initial. These are some sketches. My initial sketches of what I was thinking about. Um, how my installation would come together, and I think I'm very very happy because um, my. I think the final product looks very much like these early sketches. Um, but what I was really trying to capture with with my installation was really just the scale of these things, how many items are in this object. Um, yeah, because it was there's just so many things and like during, you know, my visits to the collection with Wendy and working very closely also with Sedona and Nitsa as well, like being able to interact with things, these these objects was so um, I don't know, I guess like an inherent duality is the only way I can describe it, you know, as both both good and good and bad. It was like troubling to see, to unearth a lot of these objects and see how many things were in there, but also knowing that these objects were under like, you know, a lot of, a lot of under a lot of care. And that, you know, the folks at the, the Fowler and the archeological co collection um, in particularly really serve as like stewards for these objects. And that's something that I had to come to understand when interacting with these things. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And so this slide right here, um, really was another early sketch of mine that really captured just like, I really wanted to bring in like all these boxes. So like a lot of these items in, in the collection are stored in these um, like acid-free boxes. Um, and in the middle right there is like that bag. So we saw that earlier picture of me like physically going through them and looking at these, these bags of earth, of shell mitten, uh, bone fragments. Um, so, you know, when I was approached with this opportunity, I was really unsure of like what objects would be in this collection, uh, would be in the collection. And once going through this, I was just really surprised at some of the things that, um, you know, made their way into, into the collection that are being stored. So, so there's just a lot like very interested and enamored with just the amount of, of bags and of of like bone and shell mint. Like I really didn't under still quite, don't quite understand like what is the, the purpose of, of storing these things. I think a lot of this stuff could be returned to the earth, but it's really interesting to see, you know, what goes into the production of knowledge, what you know, decides to get saved and what is what is worth saving um, in these collections. So just very, very, very interesting, a very mixed, you know, a lot of mixed feelings, I would say. But ultimately, I think what was really reassuring is knowing that, you know, despite what's in all of these boxes, and I have no, no idea because I was only able to go through a fraction, but to know that they're under, you know, deep and immense care and that our community does have access to these spaces. And that was that was something new for me. I think like, for me, there's this misconception of like a, like a lot of these objects are like closely guarded and insular and only folks that have access to the institution can interact with these objects and items. But, um, you know, this opportunity really showed otherwise that I could go in there, physically touch these things, see them and really start to understand the, the curation process and what goes into to saving these items. So, um, yeah, can we go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is a wide shot of um, the installation and it's scaled down somewhat from the sketches I, I showed you. Uh, but still, I really wanted to to bring these these boxes. I feel like that was such an important thing is is the way that these objects are stored. Um, so what we have here is um, some of the boxes taken from the archaeological collection. There's also a mixture of archival documents and also artifacts um, taken from these boxes and from the collection. And on the wall as well as a as a posters um, from from the archival materials that I was able to come across. Um, so I like to, wanted to be very intentional with the objects that I curated um, 
in terms of showing like a juxtaposition of like traditional artifacts, you know, things that come from our ancestral times, but also the way this information, these items have been cataloged and how um, really this knowledge has come to be. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So these are some shots of, of me preparing for the install. The image to the left is me kind of going over my um, initial sketches and just the, the list of items. So I really wanted to capture that those initial sketches that I put together. Um, and I think very much like Mercedes, uh, my process was very much intuitive. Um, like when I was approached with this opportunity, I didn't quite know what I was going to do, like curating um, things, like curating a show or not a show, excuse me, an exhibit like this or an install, I should say, is, is rather new for me. So it was a new experience, like not physically creating, creating something myself, like a painting, I'm a painter. Um, but, you know, trying to take all these, this, this massive amount of objects and, and whittle it down to something that, that would make sense, right, to kind of um, really share some insight into the pro in, into this process that goes of gathering, you know, these objects, how they come to be, how they've come into the Fowler's um, collection. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is an image of, of the poster. I was really enamored with, with this image. It was, um, it's blown up. Um, it's no longer to the original scale, but I just thought it was really, inter really interesting to see this, to see kind of like, I think in the past, a lot of like gatekeeping in terms of who has access to these sites, like how these, really how these objects came to be. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was, you know, really interesting. This archeologists are engaged here in digging up the remains of California's historic and prehistoric past and what they will learn to help you understand the complex and exciting story of man's past life and part of the state. Um, so just, just really interesting. I think it's, you know, a very um, academic approach to, to understanding these objects. And I, I think what, you know, provides some, some solace and understanding and, and working on this project is that, you know, people from our community are now in positions to, to really help oversee these projects and make sure that, you know, our, our, our artifacts and objects are being, are being well taken care of. Um, and also like just, you know, looking, going through the archival information, it was troubling to see like what photographs were, were published, how folks were deciphering this information and really talking about us as, as a community and as a people. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And so this image right here um, is, is a close up of some of the boxes. And one of the things that really, what I really wanted to focus on is these boxes because I was just so enamored with this, this all the information that's on these boxes. It was really hard to decipher. Um, but I was very um, intentional of choosing boxes of um, sites of, 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 of importance to, um, to, you know, to my community, to my family. So there's, sites from, there's boxes from sites like Playa Vista, um, the San Pedro Housing Project. So I really wanted to pick boxes that are important and relevant to, you know, to myself and to my family. So in, and in that process, like I, I've known about these sites, the, the development process that goes into them, but I never had the opportunity to like firsthand experience and see, you know, see what it, what, what comes up from the earth, what happens in the process of development. So, um, you know, these boxes are really good to kind of demonstrate, you know, just a very small portion of the scale because there's, there's so many boxes in this collection. It was, um, you know, just very, very exciting and interesting to see. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And these are some close up shots of um, some of the artifacts and the archival materials that I chose. There's like ascension logs that there's an ascension log to the left in the left image that has like all these objects cataloged as to you know what they they pretty much unearthed during these um these archaeological excavations there's like a mortar and pestle so like really again harkening back to this juxtaposition of ancestral um artifacts and also these you know older archival materials so to the left in the left image is like an image of an advertisement for housing development that was going to go up at Playa Vista, which was a huge um, point of contention when that was happening. And then the image to the right is, is more archival materials. You see archaeologists, like there's like an image to the far right, um, image of these archaeologists and all their all these items that they've, they've unearthed. Um, and there's also like some photographs right there of, of some of these development sites. And that was just really interesting because I've, I've heard about these things, especially as a young person, um, you know, very important in our community. And to know that you know there's folks advocating um, to be present when all this stuff was happening. So, yeah, it was again a mix a mix of emotions going through these things. But ultimately, I think really what resonated is knowing that despite how all these objects have come in come into being or possession of the Fowler, it's good to know that um, you know they're under careful stewardship and that folks like Wendy, Mitzla, Sedona, you know, are are really really mindful and working with the community and giving us access to. Um, you know, to interact with the objects in this collection. 
And that will be all for me. Thank you. I want to be cognizant of our time together. I thought I thought we were going to get I thought we were going to get Wendy here. But, um, oh, there she is. Okay. Hi, Wendy. Um, yeah. Hi. So um, this is really to give us an opportunity to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about the process and and how we sort of came to looking at at these issues and and really I think for our audience who doesn't really get a chance like uh, to, to have uh, some glimpses into some of these conversations, we can sort of uh, chat a little bit about what that means. Um, you all, you both mentioned it and I kind of mentioned it a bit that the archeological collections while they were really created in this sort of housing and development frenzy within Los Angeles created this ginormous collection of all of LA's history, the largest in LA, um, the largest that exists in the world of LA history and that the Tongva is, is a humongous part of that, right? That goes back tens of thousands of years and has now been boxed up and other people have sort of chosen what, what goes into those boxes. Um, they tend to be from the academic community, very little have um, these decisions been made by the community themselves. And sort of what do you guys feel about that? Because I mean, I know both of your parents and your family. So I mean, this is a generational endeavor, right? So this is a family affair. So what does it mean? You, you both have grown up into it and seen it. And now as artists are, are sort of creatively, you know, talking about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, I'll jump in a little bit and say that it was the work on, as a cultural resource consultant on development sites in this process that really kind of pushed me into making art. Because for me, it, you know, it was, a re it is a really difficult process to be part of and to watch. And um, there was always this feeling of like, kind of a lot of responsibility and very little power. And so that was difficult. Um, you know, and but I've learned so much in the process, you know, you, you say like what gets held, what gets um, reinterred and, you know, I've learned a lot from my father who's very um, insistent about, you know, associated burial items going back with the people they came out of the ground with and so there's these moments where you kind of learn to respect um, these pasts things um, coming from the ground in a way that's still connected to our community, to humanity, to personhood. Um, I think where I think about sometimes these lines get drawn, um, there's like this, you know, and I know science is supposed to be objective. So, you know, grain of salt, but it's like, it's almost like it's too dehumanized and, and like, you know, especially with human remains, even I get this question like, well, what does it matter? You know, it's it's just, right? it's hard for me to even say, but like, why why is this even important? And and you think, well, because we we care for these people. They are they're our family, and and so I think um, part of why I talk about it, you know, now as an artist, you know, coming in, you know, as a young person doing this work on sites, and now talking, it it, it opens up conversations about visibility, about land, about. Um, cultural um, sovereignty. You know, I really, actually, Wendy, I noticed very intentionally you were saying cultural heritage and not artifacts. And I just had a conversation with somebody about that. And they said cultural belongings, but it's it's even a shift in how we think about um, the activeness of the objects, the um, life of them as objects. I think that's kind of what, what is always, um, important to me. And even so, like I said, even something like an abalone for, shell for me is, has that like life in it. Um, so, you know, even if it's not me, something that would have been collected on a different site, you know, maybe, maybe not. So anyways, I'll be quiet. Maybe we can <laughs> jump in. Wow. So I think, you know, we made a, a very profound point, Wendy, um, that this, this whole process very much has been a generational endeavor. And I think that's, you know, that really resonates in um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I feel like it's just engaging in this work, like being there, you know, 
um, to help protect these items like during you know the excavation process and you know when folks are working on this development is, is, is very challenging and knowing like how much of contention that is evolving how much just you know my own family has been involved in that process but it's also like very very heartwarming to know that there's this this care and love that persists through time you know and it makes me think of like not only what is our responsibility of, of caring for these objects in the past, the present, but also in the future, what does that look like, right? Um, you know, how, and how do we engage with these things? And I think it's also important to know that like, you know, a lot of the important like funerary items and, you know, ancestral remains have, have been returned to the earth, but there still is that careful caretaking of, you know, the rest of all these things that we still have in this collection. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenging task. Like stewardship is, is not easy. It's an immense responsibility. But knowing that, you know, there's there's allies on on both ends from within our own community at the institutional level to support, you know, this type of work is just it's just deeply important. Um, I don't know. I just it makes me think of just this immense responsibility that is going to persist throughout time and, and even moving forward to, you know, you know, how, how will these these items continue to be like where, where will they wind up? Will they re re return to the earth where they belong? But it's it's very much a challenge and something that you know, is really not not for the faint of heart. And, and I, you know, respect and admire all the folks that are, you know, involved in the caretaking and, and, and stewardship of these items. It's, it's very challenging. You know, we, we get to this point too of, of kind of changing the, the dialogue of them being, of these art, artifacts being research objects, right? It, the, the lexicon and the word and the terminology become so critical, like you were mentioning, Mercedes, in terms of whether or not the, the proximity is there. One, do folks recognize that there are over 3,000 Tongva in Los Angeles that still exist and still live day to day and, and do their thing and remember their, their families' histories as well. Um, so closing that gap and moving it away from an, a strictly academic endeavor and only, you know, uh, academics care, right? Only archeologists care about this cultural heritage and would do something with it. So we were preserving them. When I came in, it was we were preserving them for future generations within academia. And then because of NAGPRA and having to work with the community so much, it's sort of like for me, I, you know, my training was in, in Belize and Mesoamerica. And, and there was always um, a, a different lens when I came in. Like I didn't know anything. So it was all of your families, right? They knew your families who taught me what these objects were and how they were used and members of the, the Tatavium and the Hashemen and Shumash um, families that, that really spent that time. And we would go to Pimu behind me and, and we spent time together having nothing to do with the father, right? It was that community engagement and ceremony and just daily living that sort of brought these objects back to life. And um, I know when, when uh, Matthew first approached me about having objects from the collections, that was the first thing that brought, that came to mind was, well, how can I make those decisions, right? It's up, you guys have to do that. You have to demonstrate that these are living, that those connections are vital and, and really an important part of, of, you know, day to day and the generational thing. And um, I just wanted to sort of, you know, thinking about that, thinking about Playa Vista in particular, which is what we're, you know, is, is being brought in. Uh, Cindy Alvitre and I went down and, and Mercedes, your dad was the one kind of holding everybody together and then Anthony Morales and, and his community and, and all these folks were doing their best from different communities of Tongva to try to stop this project. But I remember Cindy and I going to meet with the, the development people and they were, they were telling us that, um, you know, Cindy was advocating basically that this was a cemetery that was being destroyed for this housing development. And, and uh, they were like, well, it's not a cemetery because under, under law, under health and resource code, it doesn't exist through, um, span, through uh, the US period, right? So if it's a Spanish cemetery, it doesn't count. It has to be when it became the unit part of the United States. And it didn't, it didn't matter that we were now talking about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of burials that were being removed, it was still not given, you know, back to this terminology, this idea of a cemetery. And so how do you guys grapple with that? How is that reflected where, you know, your own past is denied to you through the sort of machinations of either legal standing or through academic research that, that push you, try to push you and keep that distance, you know, between. 
Um, you, I'll, yeah, I'll start. So I don't know. It's, I mean, ex extremely challenging. I think you, you know, really touched upon like some of the ridiculous nuances of, of like, you know, Western law, the things that we encounter as, as indigenous people, you know, just the odd framing of, you know, what is defined as a cemetery. But I guess like one, one of the ways that is, you know, that helps me navigate it, I think, even within our own community as well, is just like the changing and framing of how, you know, we all not only interpret these objects, but how the institution, the academy is starting to interact and engage with indigenous communities, with our own community. So I think, you know, changing just that, that framework and that pedagogy of, you know, stepping away from the, I don't want to say the academic lens, but, you know, really understanding, you know, aspects of traditional knowledge, the way our community, um, you know, takes responsibility with, with engaging with these objects and, and, you know, what that means. Um, and just like, you know, also, I think it's really, really keen and important that, you know, folks like yourself have, you know, positioned themselves to, to really re reframe the way that, you know, um, folks within the academy, you know, work and really center indigenous folks, our voices and, and you know, what our demands are and, and what that means to be able to, you know, continue stewardship over these items in a way that is both mutual and respectful. Um, so, but yeah, I don't know, it's, it's just extremely challenging, but I think like, really what, what's key and resonates the most is that shift in stewardship, you know, really um, relying on, on, on one another and, you know, being, being good, have, having good allies in places where, when it's important, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree about the ally part. Um, you know, um, when I think about Playa Vista, when, when I heard about this project, particularly, I knew it was those objects that I wanted to work from. Um, having worked there during the reburial process, which was a really um, difficult, painful process. And like, it still um, holds a lot of emotion for me. It still um, is a difficult thing to even think about um, what, what happened there. Um, in, a, in a beautiful way, my father just actually put up a couple of monuments or a, a monument there that, is at least a marker to what to to the people of that place, the original and continued presence of the Tongva people. So that was kind of a, a healing moment. Um, but um, it's hard because it feels like it never should have happened. It um, and um, I I think that. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of uh, what I think when you go out into a, a, a beautiful piece of, of, of the land of the earth and you watch your ancestors be taken out of the ground, um, it's a very difficult thing to watch. And it, you know, I don't like to like throw the word traumatic around, but it, it, it echoes that. And, you know, I think so much about the history of, of indigenous native people in the United States and there's so many traumatic moments to reconcile with. There's so many moments in history of the city of Los Angeles to reconcile with. And so, you know, me as an artist and why I, I want to kind of have a voice in spaces where people might listen is, you know, I kind of, I'm like, well, maybe we can stop the like, stop the, the ongoing traumas, you know, that we can just like not, that we already have to reconcile with so much and then kind of continue to add on top of that other moments where you're just, you know, very difficult moments. Um, I, I think, I, you know, that's kind of, you know, I don't know if that answered the question and I'm trying not to get too uh, in the weeds with the experience, but um, I do feel like that site was important. It was about community and um, voice. And, and, and I'm hopeful that maybe that wouldn't happen again. Uh, you know, because of all of the conversation and thought and, and, and effort behind, you know, the aftermath. Well, and I think uh, both of you, your, your, both of your art styles is sort of incorporate and, and play with that time. Like it's, you, you get sort of this framing of, oh, that's a contemporary artist. And both of you have been called contemporary artists, but both of you have these, this, continuity between the past and the present and um you know and how does that sort of how important is that to you and in, in feeding into your work whether it, you know even if it is traumatic it, it's still it's very present right you have to work through it 
and it's it's hard not to see it and maybe it's you know i'm used to that those little pieces inside there right i i know what you're you're meaning when you're putting these things in but um yeah if you guys would talk about it i mean I would just say like, I, I, I use that word and I hesitate to use that word, but I feel like the, uh, you know, making art and kind of going through this press and these like what I call them ceremonial interventions in the landscape images I make or these kind of interventions I do is about healing. It's about reclaiming. It's about recoding the land as indigenous to point my lens, point my camera, let the viewer see these spaces that retain our presence you know I would argue all spaces do but you know to really kind of focus in on these moments where where I'm showing the viewer very clearly um, that there is contemporary indigenous presence um, so yeah I think the art definitely um, takes these past experiences and the research and the stories and all of that and um, it's it's necessary to move forward. It's 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 a it's a privilege, you know, to to be here, to not have been like the fact that I'm even you know here as a as a Tongva person is pretty miraculous in, in a lot of ways. And so I take that privilege, but it's it's tied to the past. And 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 in, in having those ties to the past also allows us to have a future. And that's kind of where I'm really trying to push is that we we. Um, it's all connected and it's a continuum. It's not um, a singular moment or point or person or event. Okay. Ooh, that was beautiful, tough to follow. <laughs> um, wow, so I don't know. I feel like, you know, as, as an artist, part of my practice is very, very difficult to, to separate the two, you know, the past and the present, like being a contemporary artist. But I think like, you know, a lot of what Mercedes has mentioned so far, like just really resonates with me. I think as I start to think about, you know, continuity, bringing in both the past, present and future. But for me, a lot of it is like, you know, how do, how do we reconcile the troubling, you know, aspects of the past, you know, what has happened, all of the trauma that our community has experienced and that, we, you know, we still experience today. Um, but also, you know, I think part of, you know, this work is engaging in, you know, some form of a visual sovereignty, you know, defining our narrative moving forward. And really, I think, you know, rec reconciling what happens in the past and, you know, giving our our input and, and really sharing our, our worldview because as Mercedes mentioned, it, it really is miraculous that, that we are here today. So being able to, you know, have the opportunity to, to create works of art that speak to our, our ancestors, to speak to future generations and speak to our experience now is, is, is deeply important. But I think a lot of it for me is like, is reconciliation and really understanding and coming to terms with, you know, the weight and what it means to be a, to be a Tongva person existing in the past, present and, and in the future. Good, I'm having so much fun. Um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, kind of switch it over and, and look at some of the Q and A. Um, and one of the questions that had been had been raised was about repatriation challenges. And we haven't really talked about the fact that the Tongva community is not recognized by the federal government. And um, and what is that? What does that really mean um, to you? Um, to both, but Mercedes, since you were you've worked in cultural resource um, protection and specifically as a tribal monitor, someone there to sort of watch over what was happening during development. How does that feeling of lack of recognition by the US government in a city like Los Angeles, how has that affected and challenged your, um, your family's ability and your community's ability to return, return ancestors? Yeah, I mean, you know, I always, I think I even said this, but like your legal power is a recommendation, right? It's not um, anything more than that. And so I think that where it's gone well, there's will to collaborate. That's kind of how, you know, River started. I started with the good allies, you know, where we've seen repatriation happen in a way that doesn't feel like you're, um, pulling someone's teeth to, to respond to like not having your ancestors sit in boxes for however many years. Um, also not being fairly recognized, we don't have land, we don't have sovereign land. And so we are also um, at the behest of others to have spaces to rebury these people, you know, to kind of put them back into the earth where they belong. And so, I mean, the lack of federal recognition has so many facets 
that are ongoing and, um, you know, sometimes like, you know, we've had to work with tribes that have been a recognition that really have no knowledge of our area, but just to get that like uh, um, validity put into the equation, you know? And, and so it's, it's really hard because um, it's all based on, again, land and unratified treaties and these payments that went out and for exchange and, and it just, you know, it, it almost feels the same way that's kind of like, oh, legally it's not a cemetery because I can code it this way. In the same way, it's like, there's so many things around the fact that we're not fairly recognized it. It's like, yes, we know we should probably should do this thing, but we don't actually have any power. And so unless there's will to actually, you know, work with the community, um, and yes, sometimes we are tricky as a community, but we are not impossible. And, <laughs> you know, so, it's not impossible. So then you, know, you just have to have the will to do it. And I think that I see that happen in some places, which I'm very encouraged by, um, but it's really disheartening when it feels like the will um, isn't there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, challenging question, because I feel like I only have somewhat of an, not an outsider's perspective, but I just haven't been involved firsthand, you know, the way that Mercedes, her father and other community members have been in, in this process. But, you know, just based off of my own experience and seeing how, you know, members within our community have, have struggled with this, I think, you know, this idea of sovereignty really comes to a head. What, what, you know, what that means to our community, how, you know, the federal and state government decide how, you know, decide are really our sovereignty, how that, and really how that, inter, how that, that plays out as a whole. Um, you know, Mercedes really touched about a lot of important things. I think, you know, really what comes down to land and how, how difficult it is for a community that, you know, that, that lacks like a, you know, a, a land access to a land base permanently. Um, you know, this idea of reinterment, you know, what happens when we, when we do come across these items, what do we do with them? Where do they go? And that's been a persistent challenge, but, you know, one that, you know, luckily we have been able to work with other, other communities and, and allies and, and figuring that out. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think it really, for me, when, when I think of this question, it just makes me think of like, you know, the struggles of sovereignty, like how, how can we, we carve our, you know, find our, own, find our own sovereignty really in this, this entire process. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and hopefully how will that be redefined moving forward? We have one other our question from uh, one of our esteemed audience members, Vishana Gaiman, um, who, who really loves the idea of bringing uh, life and, and breath back to these objects. Um, and she's asking a, a question that, that works for me as well, uh, as I expect Wendy does. Do either of you uh, plan to return to the lab um, so that you can continue to use um, uh, the resources in your ongoing art? Thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and also as well, like sort of what's next for, for both of you um, in engaging with these cultural belongings. Go ahead, River. you seem like okay. you wanna say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, so yeah, if the opportunity presents itself, I, I would love to. I think, you know, just a very brief amount of time that I was able to spend this collection was, I was only able to see like a, see a fraction of, of things, of all the, of the objects in this collection, you know, these, these really important things. So I, I would just, you know, love to be able to, to dive in deeper and like just also just being inspired by the installation that you did, Mercedes. I think, you know, our, <laughs> our installation pieces are, are so, so very different, but I, I don't know, I would love to be able to, you know, engage physically, handle these objects and, and yeah, perhaps, you know, create something out, out of them in how, whatever iteration that looks like. But I think, you know, I would love to have, you know, other members of the community also be able to engage and see how they interpret these objects, how other works of, you know, other works of art could really come to be. Um, so yeah, I think that would just be a beautiful opportunity and really, you know, continue to develop these relationships, not only with the institution, but also with these objects. So that, you know, they are, they are important to us as people, as, as indigenous folks, as, you know, you know, objects of our, of our ancestors of, of the land. So yeah, I think it would be really, really interesting to kind of maybe even for myself, like shift what an installation would look like, you know, gravitating away from really shedding light on the institutional side of things and how I interpret my experience there, but actually physically interacting with them and making something out of it. There's just, you know, so much potential. Um, yeah, very, very inspired by the work that you did, Mercedes. Thank you. 
and I, I would also say, oh, sorry, Mercedes, the, um, you know, that, that the one great part about both of you being in there is that these collections, right, would otherwise be sitting on a shelf and in waiting for some researcher to come in. So having community members come in and actually keep them living and, you know, interacting with people, I think that that's just wanted to throw that in there. I think that's a critically important, both, you know, for the collections themselves to, to feel important again and valued. And, um, you know, for us as an institution, why are we holding on to them? Yeah, I mean, I think early on in some of the conversations, I was like, well, what if I do this whole photo series with the, uh, like I was, I was proposing something else. And uh, it was like, well, not, maybe not at this moment. So, you know, I have ideas I think that um, would be interesting. I, it was such um, an experience to kind of have this reconnection with these things, because I remember when they were in that hangar and in the boxes and seeing them there and the barcodes and the tags, it was like this strange echo of memory. And at times it was very emotional. You know, I definitely believe that objects have an energy and have a life to them. And I'm imbued with those people who have held them. And so, you know, it's kind of this interesting moment to be in that collection. And I probably could have, I, I think I, I don't remember how many days I spent in there, but I could have spent many, many more just because, um, just so much to kind of interact with. So I, I'd love to kind of work with them and think around that and um, yeah, continue this kind of relationship. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. All right, guys, we are running out of time. Thank you so much, Mercedes and River for just being so honest and forthcoming with us today. You know, everything that you shared really brings us closer to you and your work. And we're just really honored that you shared your energy with us today. So thank you. And Matthew and Wendy, thank you for guiding us through this hour and sharing with our audiences just a little bit of behind the scenes work that goes on at the Fowler. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you're local, we hope that you will come to the Fowler soon and check out these beautiful installations for yourself in person, in a real time and in a real space. This program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on our Facebook and in the next few days on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for everyone to revisit and share as you see fit. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next program on Monday. Details can be found on the closing slide. In the meantime, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye, thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>